keen interest in, in Ethiopia for, uh, for many years. I, I first visited the country in 1984, the year of Band-Aid. Um, quite a lot has changed in the interim time between then and, and actually going back in 2018. Um, we visited some of the same areas, but tonight I'm going to take you on a journey. The image that you're all seeing on the screen at the moment is, is the, probably the most uh, sought after of the endemic mammals. This is the rarest canid in the world, this is Simeon Wolf, but I'm going to come on to that. That's on the top of the Barlet Mountains. Now, I'm first of all, I'm going to show you a few maps just to put you in a picture of where we are. So you can see uh, the UK at the top of the screen now. I hope you can see my point to where I'm, I'm pointing to. So Ethiopia is here, here's Addis Ababa. Um, this is the Horn of Africa you're talking here. And the Rift Valley comes down through Ethiopia and right down into, into, um, into southern, southern parts of Africa as you go along. And then northwards, obviously, up through the Red Sea and into Israel. But the, the country itself, is, it's, a, it's a huge piece of land. It's, a, it's as big as France. Um, and, and there's a whole range of habitats which I'm going to take you through, ranging from high mountain moorlands down to, down to scrub deserts and everywhere in between, lakes, heathlands, forests, and everywhere. Um, what you're seeing on the, map, on, on the screen there is a, is, a, is a slightly more detailed one. I think I've got one slightly bigger. There we go. Okay, so Addis Ababa, which is the capital, is the cent in the centre of the, pretty well in the centre of the country here where my pointer is. We, we, when we flow into Addis, uh, the, the, the first 24 hours roughly you spend around the, the city and you, you're at some altitude there because you're in what's called the Western Highlands. The Rift Valley running down here actually dissects the two lots of highlands. You've got the, the Western Highlands over here and then the, the Barley Mountain Massif down here in the south of when it's dissected by the, by the, uh, the Rift Valley. Um, and, and so consequently, you get a, a completely different avifauna and, 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 and plant life and, and ant mammals in the, the Rift Valley than you do in the, in the highlands. Um, what I'm going to do is take you up onto what's called the, the Salalta Plain and across to, to Deborah Labanus here, to what's known as the Blue Nile Gorge. You can see where I'm putting my pointer here. Then we're going to come across to Deborah Burhan down through the Rift Valley, all the way down here to uh, Lake, Lake Awasa, up to the Bali Mountains to Goba, and then across the mountains here. Um, our plan was to actually cut down to Magali here, but due to local troubles, which happens in Ethiopia, we had to go all a long way around, so we lost some time, considerable time doing that, because as you can imagine, the roads aren't brilliant. And eventually we worked our way right across to Yabello, to the Yabello Wildlife Sanctuary, which is about 50 miles north of the of the Kenyan border, so Kenya would be just south of here. And then we came back up through the Rift Valley, out to the east, heading towards Somalia and Djibouti, to what's known as the Allegheny Plain and the Arwash National Park, which are a totally different habitat, again, being a acacia scrubland and semi-desert. So without further ado, I'm going to take you roughly on that route, which takes you through a whole host of of, of habitats and I'm going to start in, in Addis Ababa. So like most most African modern capital cities it's coming kicking and screaming into the 21st century and, and there's lots of building and development going on um, and, and I have to say that at this point that the, the two things that struck me between my two visits the first in 1984 and the second in 2018 was a, the amount of, of, of people that are now in the country, um, the population has trebled in that 30 odd years, and also the amount of deforestation that's gone on in some areas. So there's been vast changes in, in, in habitat, in the way of habitat damage in, in some places anyway. Um, but up in, the, up in, in Addis Ababa itself, you, you're at about six and a half thousand feet above sea level. So you've got quite a temperate climate. And one of the things that, that greets you as, you as you literally come out of the airport are, are birds. There's birds everywhere. Um, this is a, a montane thrush. It's one of, the, one of the common highland birds that you see. A um, member of the typical uh, thrush family. Um, but there's a group of these sort of basically orange and black thrushes that, that live in, or orange and brown thrushes, shall I say, that live in Africa, all uh, 
specialists in various types of habitat and all differ with minor features, but they're all along this basic brown and orange plumage. And, and around the, the city itself, I think it's largely because everything isn't tidied up like it would be here in, in, in Europe. You've got lots of weed seeds still blowing about. You've got, you know, odd trees left where they are. They're not cut down. And there is some obvious habitat damage because of what I've just talked about. But there are birds all over the place. And some of the some of the, the, the rather special things that you get are, th are things like this right around the, the hotel. So this is a, a dusky turtle dove. Um, and, and this was literally outside the, the front door of the hotel. Really nice bird closely related to our turtle dove, as you can see, but uh, it gets its name because of this obviously greyer, darker plumage. Um, we, we, we literally landed, the last time we went there, we landed and transferred straight to the hotel, got a drink, dumped our bags, and went out into the, into the hotel grounds and, and, and birded for one, on and off for most of the rest of the day. Um, and and the, 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 the hotel grounds are a really good place, as with many foreign trips, to get your grounding in some of the, the really common species. So above you in the, in the air all the time when you're in Addis Ababa are, are these guys and these are hooded vulture. Um, they're the, the commonest of the, of the vulture species probably. You see, you'll see, you see these every day in, in Ethiopia. But the, the numbers, as with vultures all over Africa, the numbers are not what they were. They are declining right across Africa. Um, and, and things like in Sudan, for instance, the army were using, using hooded vultures for target practice. So uh, what a stupid waste of, uh, of wildlife. It's just crazy. But fortunately, in Ethiopia, there, there's, I've seen no evidence of hunting at all. Um, the only, in the two visits I've made, the only, the only one thing I've seen was a local bloke who, who, who killed a pigeon and that had got a, a broken wing, so he killed it and took it for the pot. But other than that, obviously, no evidence of hunting whatsoever. So going back onto these, these are hooded vultures. Uh, that's a, that's a, those were adults. This is a juvenile. You can see how it gets its, its name from the, the brown hood that it's got here. And they're one of the, the two smaller species of vultures. Uh, the Egyptian vulture is the other one that, that basically fits this jizz and shape. And these have got very small, narrow, narrow bills. And they're usually one of the, the later species to arrive at a carcass. They, they are common in all the Ethiopian cities and towns, mainly because they scavenge around the rubbish dumps, as, as opposed to, to, to being totally carrion feeders. These guys are, are scavengers. Um, they, they're, 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 they're small bills, like with the Egyptian vulture, means that they can't really rip open big carcasses. And that's where the bigger vultures fit into the equation. But I'll talk more about that in a little while. So we, we, we walked through the hotel grounds and, uh, and we got a, a local guide with us and, and I was at the head of the group and we went to a, down a path and we'd been looking at a few bits and pieces like bee eaters and, 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 and stuff like this. And then the, the, the guide suddenly said, okay, we're gonna stop here because the path's a dead end. We're gonna go back the opposite way. So all of a sudden I'd gone from being at the, at the front of the group to being at the back of the group. And uh, as we turned to walk back, I spotted this raptor come through coming through and above the trees, you see, and I thought, oh, this is, it's an air's hawk eagle, because I'm, I'm really, really keen, as some of you will remember on my birds of prey when I, I talked to you last time, and, and this was a bird that I'd never seen in real life, I'd seen photographs and paintings of this bird, and I just, I, I couldn't believe my eyes, and I called to the, Miyashu, the guide, I said, Miyashu, there's an air's hawk eagle up here, at which point it had just vanished behind a, behind a tree, and, uh, and he looked at me and he shook his head. He said, no, it won't be. I said, it is, it's an air's hawk eagle. And for a few heart, hearts and wrenching seconds, it vanished, this bird did. And then all of a sudden it came out again. And sure enough, there above us was this, this air's hawk eagle, which is closely related to booted eagle. And it's much the same size, but it, it's got these really broad wings, that short, wing, short but broad wings that many of the forest eagles have. And... Uh, I, may I show you the, the, the guide he, 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 You can hear sort of an audible clong as his, as his jaw hit the ground almost. And, 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 and as it flew away, he said to me, that's a really rare bird, you know? I said, I know it's a really rare bird. I said, how many of those have you seen before? He said, two. <laughs> We'd only been in the country an hour at that point. So that was, a, that was a really good way to start. And the birds just kept coming. So this is Air's Hawk Eagle. It's a, a typical forest eagle, mainly a, a, a small mammal hunter but it's got a, a broken distribution 
So all the forested regions of Central Africa, right across to the Western Africa, and some down into the into the east side, but nowhere is it a common bird. Um, but the raptors were were phenomenal on this trip, on the last trip. They were they were good on both trips, but this last time we actually clocked 46 species of raptor. But there are all sorts of endemic birds in, in, in Ethiopia. This is one of the first endemics that we came across. This is white collared pigeon, and there's actually 31 species of endemic birds. Um, and something like 13 species of endemic mammals. Um, and the, 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 the list keeps changing. It's hard to keep up because of stuff being reclassified and subspecies being split and things. So the, 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 the count of endemics goes up and down. But this, this is one of the, the commoner endemics. It's, it's in the central highlands and it's right up into, the, into the, the mountains and in the cities. But pretty well everywhere in central Ethiopia, you come across these guys and these are white colored pigeon. We, after lunch around, around uh, Alice, we went to a, a place called the Imperial Marsh, um, which was only a, really a, a short bus ride from the, the hotel itself. And uh, the marsh itself was, was surrounded by buildings and, and, and development. Um, unfortunately, as in a lot of African cities, a lot of rubbish dumped in there, but the birds were great there. And, the first thing that struck us were numbers of ibises, both the, 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 the sacred ibis, which you see here, and the wattle ibis, which is another endemic, which I'll show you, show you later. But any piece of, of fresh water has lots and lots of birds on it. Um, so this is the wattle ibis. This is another one of the endemic species. And it's so cool because underneath the throat here, it has a tiny little wattle of, of skin hanging, which on a, a, a shot I've got later in, the, in the, the, the slideshow, you'll be able to actually see that that feature. But uh, wattled ibis is restricted again to the Ethiopian highlands, as a, a lot of this, this, the, these endemic bird species are. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it's a bit of a mystery why some of these species are restricted, because when you look at these birds and they're able to feed on rubbish dumps, you'd think that they'd be able to feed on any rubbish dump through Africa, but for some reason they're restricted to the highlands of Ethiopia. Um, and and, and as is this bird, this is another one of the endemics, this is Rouget's rail. Um, the, 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 the rail itself, it's, it's sort of very closely related to our water rail, as you can see, but, but nowhere is it common, and, and this is one of the birds that's actually declining. And you can see, you can see the habitat that it's feeding in here, it's full of rubbish. I mean, this was what obviously once, with a name like the Imperial Marsh, once a lovely clean little marshland, but Unfortunately, in the centre of Addis, the birds are wading, th wading through knee-deep rubbish, um, which is a bit of a, a bit of a, a shame. But nonetheless, we got some good birds, um, and and very quickly we, we caught up with this guy. And at first glance, people would be forgiven for thinking it was a, a common snipe, but it's actually African snipe. Uh, and in, in Ethiopia, African snipe are basically restricted to the highlands in the main. And they they have a they they're quite quite sort of dark really with these really ginger lines down the down the mantle um, and quite a strong strong patterning. But when they fly and you can't see it in the shot in the tail the outside of the tail they show an awful lot of white and and very little in the way of a tra white trailing edge to the wing as a common snipe would have. The other habit they've got is if they flush they actually fly they do what a jack snipe does they'll literally come out of the vegetation fly 50 yards and drop straight back into it and go to ground. Um, and we'd, we'd, we'd actually flushed this guy by accident as we were walking across this piece of grassland and it, it dropped into this ditch. So we, we walked up and all of a sudden Miyashu froze and, and pointed over his sort of over his shoulder. He was pointing down to me and I popped my head over his shoulder and there was this African snipe just sat there. And this was the one and only photograph I managed to get to get of it. <laughs> and then, because obviously I had to come out of the way so all the rest of the group could see. But that's a, a really nice way to, to get. And we saw we saw numerous other ones when we were up in the highlands, little patches of water. But nowhere are they common and numerous, so they were they were a, a, a nice bird to catch up with. Another one of the endemics is Abyssinian long claw, um, closely related to larks and pipits. Um, typical long claw. Um, minor differences between that and the other long claws got the yellow throat and the, the yellow sort of four supercilium above the eye. Um, but, but by and large, it's, it's, it's minor little differences in song that split this from other African long claws. Um, and again, found in the Ethiopian highlands, restricted to the, the sort of large open grassy areas rather than any forested areas. Um, and so consequently in these areas, 
the long claw is, is, is again quite a common bird. And what was surprising was that with many of these, these endemic birds, when you find them in their correct habitat, they're, they're not particularly rare. Um, although for how long that, uh, that remains to be seen. So the, the, the common birds of the area, the, the, there are lots, things like common fiscal, um, we came across family photo, this is a, a youngster, the, the adults being basically black above and white below. And, and, and the various other species of birds that you see like seed eaters and finches and stuff like this in good numbers. The, the, the next day we moved on, we moved out of Addis up to the north and headed up across what's called the Salalta Plain, which is this area. Um, was once heavily forested, I'm talking centuries ago now, um, large areas of it have been deforested um, and where you see large areas of forest, it's mainly eucalyptus that's been replanted since 1800 and dot. Um, the main habitat up here is grasslands, um, as you can see from these shots that I'm showing you here now. But these grasslands hold uh, a quite a wealth of birds and, 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 uh, and within this huge plain there are small lakes and tarns as they call them, um, which hold quite a number of wildfowl and things like spurwing plover and, and in particular blue wing geese. This is a, a, a yet another of the, the Ethiopian uh, endemics. And in terms of uh, uh, its family relationships, it's more more closely related to the to the, to the geese of Australia and, and perhaps South America than it is to, to our geese. But nonetheless, you can see how it gets its name by this blue panel in the wing. And this 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 bird is restricted to the to the to the mountains of both the both the, the main highland areas within Ethiopia, but not in the lowlands. Um, and that, that seems to be a, a theme that follows through. So the grassland birds, there's lots of widow birds and, and bishops and stuff like this. This is fantailed widow bird. And, and when we went, it was, it was actually uh, end of September and into October this last time. The first time I went was December. And dependent on where you are within Ethiopia, the rains come at different points in the year. Um, and in the, in the north, the, the, the rains had just finished. So everywhere was lush grass. By, by December, this area is all starting to dry out because the rains have, have been finished several months. But then as we go further south, we actually came into rains in various areas. So things like widow birds are there. This is black winged red bishop. That's another one of the, another one of the, 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 the bishops that you can see up there. And at this point in the year, because the rains have just finished, all these bishops are in spanking plumage because they're all just now breeding so lots of display by the time you get to sort of december they've all finished breeding and consequently they're all in heavy molt and they all look mainly like sparrows as you would as you would you've probably seen many times on on, on films and photographs so the the, the, the these these uh, open plains are, are a, a great place to pick up raptors and as we neared, uh, we've seen several several species as, as we came across the, the plane itself, stopped to look at things like Lana Falcon and that. But as we neared uh, the, the, the Blue Nile Gorge at Deborah Labanas, um, which is about 60 miles north of Addis, we spotted two tawny eagles on the side of the road a little distance. So we pulled up, this is a tawny eagle, this is a, a juvenile tawny eagle. Um, we pulled up to watch them from, from the bus. And we'd only been there uh, three or four minutes perhaps, and the driver in the, in the front suddenly said to us, well, aren't you not going to look at this, these birds in front of the bus? And we stopped and looked. And there in front of the bus, there's a, a smashed up hair that had obviously been hit by a vehicle. And there were two lapid faced vultures, which is this guy, which are absolute monsters. And if I show you this guy next to a, next to a tawny eagle, that'll give you some idea of size. <laughs> so there's a tawny eagle, which is not that much smaller than a golden eagle and there's a, a lapid face, an adult lapis face vulture with it. So that's the, the biggest eagle in Africa, uh, sorry, vulture in Africa. And that was joined by this guy, which is a, a female white headed vulture. And that's, a, I have to say, that's a, a pretty spectacular bird. White headed vulture being the rarest vulture in Africa, declined terribly uh, over its entire range. Um, that's a white headed vulture. And you can see, to my eye, looking at that, you can see where the, the Egyptians got their ideas for some of their headdresses from by looking at that bird. You can just see the shape of the head on that there is really distinctive. And of course, in, if you go back 2000 years, these birds would have been extremely common and would have been, would have been visible to, to, to them any day of the year. Um, so that's a female. The male has less white in the wing here. He's much browner than, 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 the, than, the, than the female. 
almost as big as a white-headed vulture. And it's those two species, the, the, the lappet-faced and the, and the white-headed, that are usually first at, at a kill or at a, at a carcass. And, and the smaller vultures, such as the, the hooded I showed you earlier, rely on these big chaps to rip the carcass open so that they can get in and feed. So there you go, there, there, was, a, there was a smashed up hare on the side of the road and, and the, the vultures and the eagles were having a bit of a squibble squabble about who was going to get to feed on it. And, and, and amazingly, they just sat there while we got off the bus and, and, and walked virtually right up to them and took loads of photographs. And this is one of the beauty with Ethiopia, the, the fact that the wildlife has not been persecuted. Stuff's very, very tame um, and you get some tremendous views. So up at the Blue Nile Gorge itself, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic, fantastic area. The, 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 the gorge itself drops away in layers that are sort of terraced, as you can see here, is one of the terrace, terraces that have been worn away by the water in the bottom. And this is the, this is the river down here in the bottom. Of the valley that you can see, and you, 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 you're sort of well over a thousand feet from the the top where you're standing here. We're on the lip of the the, the, the Blue Nile Gorge, down to the actual water below. It's a, an, an impressive sight to say the least. And, and while you're there, you've got things like lammergeiers and, and rippels, griffin vultures coming backwards and forwards. And these this this gorge and these cliffs that run right through the, this, this this part of the highlands and. And all around this, this, this area where we are of Salalta is, is the breeding grounds for many of these vultures. And this is where a lot of them have their iris and their, their in the Lamagai's case, the nest caves. Um, this is a, an adult Lamagai going back to his nest with, with food, although I haven't been able to work out what he was carrying. But I just thought it was quite an atmospheric shot. So this is a, this is a, a Lamagai in, in, in a close up view. Um, and this is a, a slightly different subspecies to the to the ones you'd see in Europe or in India. Um, it's blacker here. It doesn't have the little mark down the back of the eye, and it's got more of a black collar. Um, just bear in mind the little differences, but nonetheless, it it's basically the the, the same bird and, and does the, fills the same niche as you would see in 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 the Pyrenees or in uh, in, in the Alps now as they're reintroducing them, or even across into the Himalayas. Um, but they're a really spectacular bird, and we actually saw eleven lammergeiers on our on our trip. Now the the, the mammals, uh, because of the habitat uh, damage in large areas, the mammals have, have have been pushed out, or the bigger mammals, should we say? But in in certain areas, there's still quite a lot of of of, of mammals to be seen, and this is one of the real special ones. This is this is Gelada baboon. This is a male Gelada. Um, and this is this is him again sideways on, and you can see he gets this sort of real lion sort of mane uh, look to him. And this is a female with a baby, and these live in, in big troops, um, sometimes several hundred strong, on the, 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 the sort of lips of the of the gorges and the cliffs. And at night they retreat over onto the gorge, to the gorge faces, the cliffs to sleep and spend the night away from things like hyenas and stuff like that, so they're they're safe down there. And they live in great big troops, and, and they're quite approachable. Quite approachable. You wouldn't mess about with them. You wouldn't be silly to silly to uh, antagonise them. But uh, and certainly come between a baby and a mother, that would be a, a, a bit of a no-no. But nonetheless, they're they're really quite approachable. All these, uh, all, all the the the, the, the cliff pages have vultures, and in Ethiopia, you've still got quite a, a good number of of vultures hanging on, despite everywhere else in Africa the the numbers dropping. And what you've got here, these ones with the, 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 the scaly markings are repels griffin vultures. These are adults. This is a youngster. And these two at the back here, which you can see with the darker bills, are African white back vultures. So they're minor differences. You see their mantles plainer. But we saw vultures every day and, and sometimes in, in quite fair numbers. Um, and they were really interesting to get to grips with. And of the 46 species of raptor that we saw, there are nine species of vulture that can be seen, and we saw every one of them on this last trip. So the raptors are, are really excellent. Going across across the Salalta Plain, following the gorge round, we, we, we really were on a whistle-stop uh, a, a trip here. You can see, you can see the, 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 the type of habitat and the, the sort of rolling uh, hillsides that go away with it on the, the steps of the gorge. But everywhere, at the edge of the escarpment, uh, there are there are pockets of forest that remain, and a lot of the forest birds hang on in in those pockets, which I'll talk to you about in the, in in a few minutes. 
there are there are numerous larks as you would expect upon all these grasslands as well. Um, this one is is one of the again one of the endemics, and this is Erlanger's lark. Um, originally, it was classed as a subspecies of short short toed lark, um, and you can see for obvious reasons why. But it has now actually been split off, and it's called Erlanger's lark, and restricted again to these western highlands of of Ethiopia. We went we went. Uh, across the top of the, uh, the, the this area, the, the, the Western Highlands, to the town of Deborah Burhan, which is our next sort of major stop, um, which, as you you saw on the map, was sort of east of the Blue Nile Gorge. Uh, and and one of the first places we went to was was the rubbish tip. Um, and it's just just because of the fact that the a lot of the raptors come very very close there. So this is yellow-billed kite. Um, a split from our European black kite, and this is the this is the the African equivalent of our black kite. You do actually see black kites in winter, and this is one of our, our migrants. You can see here the slightly different look, not a sort of big bill, but also that black tip to the bill there. One or two other minor plumage differences, but again, this has been split into two species. So that's that's black kite that we're in in in. Small numbers in September because they're just on the, they're just on their way south and just arriving. But by the middle of winter, there's quite good numbers. Tawny eagles again on the rubbish dump there, um, and we got great views of lammergeiers there. There were there were a couple of juveniles scavenging up the rubbish. Unfortunately, there'd been an adult there, but some some people had gone on just in front of us to, to dump a load of stuff and and frightened off. There there was an adult lammergeier flew away as we as we were coming up the track, which was a bit of a disappointment. But nonetheless, we got great views of, of a couple of juveniles and, and stuff it as I say is so approachable it's really good. So that the habitat as you, you get to, to Deborah Burhan um, you're heading over towards Ankabar really the the habitat you, you're on the, the, the sort of lip of the of the of the rift valley really where you're on the top of the highlands the plateau is the top of the highlands and the edges as you can see here still hold remnants of forest. On the top, there are small water areas of water around Deborah Burhan, and, and that holds another one of the endemic birds, which is a real special one. This is spot breasted plover or spot breasted lapwing. Um, again, uh, found only in these, these mountain highlands, and it's, a, it's a, a sought after bird, as you can see. It's a, a stunning wader, um, and this is a, a, again one of the one of the, the, the real special endemics that we all wanted to see. And this was one that on the, my first trip to Ethiopia I actually missed. So I was really, really keen to see this bird. That was a, that was a great bird. So that's spot-breasted lapwing, um, much like a, a spur wing plover in shape. But you can see you've got this sort of nice wattle of yellow skin here and above the, the bill, more actually closely related, I would imagine, to some of the Indian wattle lapwings, such as the, the yellow wattle lapwing of, of, of India and Asia. Than, than to perhaps spur with plover. Um, there are, as well as waders and, and raptors and stuff like that, they're endemics. There are many, many small passerines. This is uh, Abyssinian black wheat here, uh, again restricted to the, the Ethiopian highlands and escarpments. Um, much like, much like many of the, the African black wheat is, it's got the this is a male, and it's got a grey crown. The female will be in a sort of sooty brown, brown coloration. Only a tiny little, little bit of white in the base of the tail, other than that, an all black bird, but typical wheat here. Uh, another one of the, 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 the common wheat ears that you see there is this one, and this is red chested wheat ear. Although this isn't an, an endemic, it's, it's spread throughout Highland and grassy areas throughout East Africa, but it's still a really nice bird to see, a real smashy looking thing. Um, so as you drive, we, we, we went sort of eastwards from Deborah Burhan across the, 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 the sort of, uh, there's a peninsula almost of, of highlands, and you come across these little these little villages where people still live and farm in, in much the traditional way, still a very sort of pastoral way of life. Um, and, and everywhere you go, you, you're, seeing, you're seeing birds. Some of them, again, this is a, another one of the endemics, this is black-headed siskin. Um, and, and they're, they're quite common. You, you really didn't have to work to find some of these. Others, like the Ankabar serine, uh, which is which is restricted to a small area of highlands just around Ankabar, we actually visited five sites for that and missed it every time. They just weren't playing ball. Um, but we, of, of the of the the thirty one endemic species, we actually caught up with twenty seven of them. So we did pretty well on this last trip. So that was a, a real real uh, a, a sort of score really. That was um so this is a, the male black headed black headed siskin. Um 
and that's that's quite common in these highlands. And this is as you get to the get, you get to to Anchorbar and you start to drop away down into the Rift Valley. This is the the sort of edge of the the actual edge of the escarpment uh, and the highlands above and the Rift Valley below. Um, and this is this is where the, the, the a lot of the forested species, things like uh, Abyssinian woodpecker and stuff like this, hang on, um, catbirds and stuff like that. They are restricted to these areas now because most of the the highland forests have been uh, have been cut down. Um, the, the temperature difference as you drop down to to the, the Rift Valley below, and this is this is at the spot called Melka Jebdu, which in terms of miles from Ankabar is about five miles in terms of distance. But in terms of height, you actually drop over three and a half thousand feet. And the temperature goes from being cold, having to wear a fleece, to absolutely boiling hot. And, and I mean, to take, take everything you can off and get down to shorts and a T-shirt because you're absolutely cooking down here. And the, 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 the shock to your system of going from one extreme to the other can be really sort of really knock you about for a little while, make you feel quite peculiar. Um, so the, the way that the itinerary was worked, we gradually, we only did this the one day, we actually came down briefly and then went back up. Um, and when we worked our way back down slowly into the into the, 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 the real hotter area, so we gradually increased the temperature, which was far, far better to cope with. So at Melka Yebdu, the, 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 there's a small river that runs down here from the highlands into the, into the Rift Valley um, to some of the lakes down there, and, and again you get you're getting a, a lot of the the sort of commoner birds, things like uh, boo boo shrikes and stuff like this, flycatchers that you would expect to see more so in the, in the Rift Valley. Things like red billed hornbill are common down here, whereas up in the Highlands you don't see them at all. Up there you're getting hempages hempages hornbill fill the niche of this guy. Things like variable sunbird. All of these birds are quite, quite numerous down here in places like that. As we climbed back up, we had a bit of a find. We, we, we were looking for mountain buzzard, which is one of the, the special birds of that area. And, uh, and we, we, we came across this bird, which was sort of hanging right on the sort of edge. You can see the ground was dropping away fantastically below us. And the, 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 the updraft of air was, was phenomenal. And this bird, it was just hanging perfectly still and moving its wings in and out. Just to just to, to keep sort of almost stationary in the air. Its head wasn't moving, although the body and wings were moving. And uh, and we thought at first it was a mountain buzzard, but when we actually looked closely, we got some some views of the underside, and I suddenly spotted it had got this one single malted in adult tail feather. And I thought, hold on, what what have we got here? And this turned out to be a red neck buzzard. Uh, well, red neck buzzard is is known from Ethiopia, but only only occasionally it's not a common bird at all and nobody really knows what the breeding status of this bird is um, they obviously are breeding somewhere not too far away because because this was a this was a juvenile bird that was just starting to molt into its adult plumage although having said that i suppose it could have traveled quite a distance from 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 its breeding grounds but nonetheless that's what it was it was a, a redneck buzzard and shots of the underside confirm the idea of that from, the, from that point on, we, we headed down away from the, the, uh, the, 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 the mountains. Um, a little more leisurely, we took him back in by Radis briefly, and then made stops as we sort of descended into, into lower Ethiopia. We made stops at places like this, which is Lake Ch Chilek. I can never say this one. Chilekaleka. Ch Ch <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful, Chilekaleka. And this is a, one of the smaller Rift Valley lakes, um, and it's it's very lush. Um, most of the year, it's, the surroundings are green, and it holds quite a lot of wildfowl, things like red-billed ducks, Makoa ducks. Um, and we got to grips with these guys, which are African pygmy geese there. They're a, a nice little goose. Um, they're, they're actually more the size of a, of a mallard, let's say, than, than a goose. Um, but they are more closely related to things like the cotton pygmy goose, of, of India than to, to any of the, the, the ducks or the geese of Western Europe that we'd expect to see here. Um, so we came, we came across them in a couple, of, a couple of the Rift Valley lakes as we went south. Um, places like, like uh, uh, Black Langana, we picked up on things like African fish eagles. Yeah, they're, they're, they're quite common in the Rift Valley. And you've got three adults here. I would suggest this is probably a, a female based on size. And these are a couple of males. And you've got a, a sub-adult bird here. You see all this 
flecking on the breast ages that bird as a subadult. Um, so the adults have a completely white white breast. My next main stop was at a, at, at a lake called Zwai, which is sort of halfway down from, from the, the Western Highlands towards the Kenyan border. And there's lots of lots of wildlife at Zwai, and we barely scratched the surface here because it's such a huge lake. Uh, the, 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 there was just birds everywhere. You see, you see here as you look across, you've got lots of marabou stalks, sacred ibis here. Uh, you've got white pelicans. Um, what else we've got? So I think you've got a white next, what, a yellow billed stalk there. You've got all sorts of bits and pieces hidden away and all this lot. And as we as we bird watched what, round there, we just kept coming across birds while we were there. Marabous, however, are one of the real dominant birds there everywhere around around Lake Zwei. Um Absolute monsters. You can see here this one. That's the the the, the, the crop. And this one's obviously fed because he's got his crop distended with food in it. Um, and to give you some idea of size, well, that's a sacred ibis next to him, but that's a marsh sandpiper down at the bottom. So you can see the size of marabous. They are they are huge. Um, these, I suggest, are probably females or juveniles, probably females, I suspect, because they'd already started breeding. And if I show you this next shot, that's a, that's a full adult male in breeding plumage. So you can see the, the, the way that the skin on the, the head and on the back of the, the neck and that all becomes very brightly coloured and clean. Um, and and, and that's, that shows them you know, that it's in full breeding, breeding plumage. And at this point in the year, down in the Rift Valley, they are, they are in this part of the Rift Valley, they are just going into their, 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 their breeding time. Um, and further south, we actually saw them with small young in the nest. Uh, but they're really common marabous are, and they might be fish eaters, but they will they will take uh, other things, small mammals. They feed on carrion, all sorts of stuff. I've even seen, I've even seen one take a dove. So they 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 are quite uh, omnivorous really in their tastes, and and I think anything that presents a meal is uh, is in danger of being eaten by that huge bill there. That you can see. We had uh, a small number of yellow billed stalks feeding in the water but these are these are not scavengers these are totally fish eaters yellow billed storks but they're a, a really nice bird to see one of the beauties of, of of all these sites we visited was how close the wildlife let you get to it this is hammercop um and another one closely related to a heron it's not a true heron that's a, a, a another shot of the actual of a full bird there on the head study and it gets its name because this sort of crest at the back of the head it's actually spelt Hammer and K O P F Hammer Kopf. It's German for hammerhead. Um, quite how it got its name in German, I don't know, but that's the that's the 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 the, 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 the name for this bird. And and their nest is is really quite interesting because they'll they'll use the same nest year on year, and they it's in a tree built in a tree, um, and they just keep adding to it. And the, the 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 one that's right by where we were here at Zwei, um, I, I, I've not put a shot of it in, but the, it was almost as big as a family car. This this nest, it was it was huge. How on earth it stayed in the tree, I don't know. But the the the, the, the poor thing about it, and this is probably why I didn't put it in, was that the was that the, the the nest was covered in bits of plastic where this, this bird, these birds had taken rubbish up and, and added it to the nest. Great white pelicans. Uh, there's a there's a breeding population, a local resident breeding population, but this is augmented in the winter by uh, migrants from Eastern Europe, um, and they're just coming into full breeding fettle in September, October when you're there, and they, they the adults get this lovely sort of you can just see a pinkish tinge to them. They get this lovely pinkish wash. They look absolutely stunning, and and again like everything, they're so tame. Sacred ibis, you can, you can literally walk up right up to these these birds. You don't have to use hides. Pike kingfishers all over the place. It's 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 just such such an excellent place. This is this is, I put this one in. Spurwing plover is one that you you get in places like Turkey and and Lesbos and places like that on occasion. But I put it in because you can actually see the spur on the wings on this photograph um, that get that give this bird its name. And of course that's a, a throwback to the days when these guys were reptiles. Um, so it's again stuff is so numerous and so tame down in the, this part of the. The Rift Valley that you can't fail with a camera if you've got a camera with you. It's just just stunning. 
And this just gives you a little bit of a, a, an idea. This is this is Dawn at Zwei. Um, you can see this guy. This guy. The, 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 the locals use a lot of these sort of horse and carts to ferry people about. And often they come down and wash them first thing in the mornings in the in the lake itself. And you can see how unfazed the birds are by that chap. Um, they were just totally not bothered. Really, really good. Um, the early morning light is fantastic for, for uh, at this one particular site for, for malachite kingfishers. This is a juvenile malachite here. Um, I've got an adult later on in the, in, in the shot. And the adults, of course, get the bright red bill. But you can see here, he's got a, a damselfly larvae in his mouth, um, which is something you don't think of kingfishers feeding on. But, but the malachites actually will feed quite a lot on damselfly and dragonfly larvae, which is quite interesting. Um, you can see that the, the, the head pattern is slightly different on, on, on these two, a common kingfish, and they get these really sort of more turquoise blue spots and bars on them. Um, and as I say, the adults have got a, a blood red bill, and of course the face patch is slightly different, it's not blue as it would be in common kingfisher. We came across these three banded plovers, which are a typical African wader, a little like a, a, a miniature kill deer. They're a, a, a stunning looking little bird in their own right. In the bushes round about, there are things like class cuckoo. Uh, there's just birds everywhere. It's it's you get to a point where you, you don't know what to photograph next. So we we, we after we managed to tear ourselves away from the from the, the Rift Valley, we drove up towards the the, the Bali Mountains, which is the southeastern area of Highlands on the on the eastern lip of the Rift Valley. Again crossing massive areas of cultivation, but everywhere you can see it's, it's low intensity farming, and this is what gives the, the wildlife a chance. Yes, the habitat's been damaged and a lot of the forests have been cut down, but things like larks and that, there's still masses of insects in the grasses so that they've got caterpillars to feed the young and they're not poisoned by insecticides and stuff like this. So there's still lots and lots of birds. And everywhere you go, you're coming across real special things. This is another one of the endemics. This is thick-billed raven. Um, and you, you can see how it gets its name quite obviously, but they've got they've got this white sort of patch on the back of the nape here and a little white tip, tip to the bill. And, and surprisingly, again, why why these birds aren't more widespread? Goodness only knows because they'll scavenge at rubbish dumps and they're feeding on dead 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 mice and stuff like that on the side of the road that have been hit by cars and picking up dead insects and all sorts of stuff that they feed on, you know. So it's 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 amazing that they're restricted to 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 just this 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 area of the highlands of Ethiopia. Here's the wattled ibis in flight. I mentioned that earlier earlier on, and I said to you, you'd be able to see the wattle, and you can see where I've got the pointer there, the actual wattle just hanging down. They get a, a this sort of glossy green sheen to the to the to the upper parts, and they sort of white scalloping on the back of the neck. Next, so they're the they're the endemic wattle ibis. You can see this bird's in molt. He's molting in a new new primary there. You can see there's molt going on in the wings here. Um, so these are these are here they, the, the rains in this part of, 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 of Ethiopia. The rains are actually happening as you go into the Bali Mountains as as we as we arrived. Um, we stopped at a, 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 as we started to climb into the, the sort of foothills. We stopped at a, a, a small quarry, and and the guy had got a, a stake out for Cape Eagle Owl, which is this guy. Um, and and literally it was a this this quarry was about 100 150 feet deep, something like that. And you had to stand right on the lip of this quarry to, to, to look at this bird. So it was, it was a little unnerving for some of the clients. You had to set we had to set a telescope up and hold people so they could look through the telescope at this bird. So that was a, a bit of an adventure in itself. So we we, we stayed overnight at, at, at Goba, the town of Goba. And then we, we went up onto the onto the, the, the Sineti Plateau, which is on the Bali Mountains. And this is the, the second highest road in Africa. These are the these the, the, the these these mountains are particularly high. You're looking towards the, the highest point there with the radio mast that you can just see in, in the distance there, and that's Mount Batu, and that's 4,307 meters. So you, you at the highest point. So you can see the height you are above above sea level there. And it is really cold up here. We we were having to wear fleeces and gloves, even though it was boiling hot down in the Rift Valley. Um, and and the day the, the, the night before we went up there, there'd been there was tremendous rain. And uh, the guy came to us, and he, he, he it's sort of about eight o'clock in the evening. He said, "We're not going to be able to go." He said, "Part of the part of the road's been washed away," and he said, "We're not going to get the, the bus up there, the tour bus up there." And so I thought on my feet a bit, and I said to him, "Is there any any people locally we could hire a couple of four by fours off?" 
And he said, I'll ask around for you. So we, we, all, we all come together. We decided we wanted to go up here so much because this was the spot for the Simeon Wolves. So we, we hired a couple of four by fours and up we went. Um, and we managed to get up where the bus wouldn't have got. We got up onto this road. And, and it goes across this tremendous landscape. To start off, we were driving through the clouds and we wondered if it would clear. And once it did clear, it was it was stunning. You've got these mountain tarns and, and tree lobelias. These are no found nowhere else in the world other than the Marley Mountains. You've got helichrysum. This is the, 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 the silver plant that you can see here. And, and a whole host of, of plants, Afro-Alpine uh, plants that are restricted purely to, to this, this one area of mountains. You can see here the giant tree lobelias, and these are how on earth the botanists make these like relates to the lobelias that you grow in your garden. I do not know, but apparently they are. Um, and, and and the bird sat up on the top here, as you can see there, is a golden eagle. Um, that just gives you some idea of size and distance. Now the Barley Mountains. Oh, sorry, that's uh, that's uh, one of the Afro Alpine uh, sort of groups of plants here. Um, don't ask me what species that is because I do not know. Um, this is this is Helichrysum, I can tell you that. Uh, but I'm, I, I won't admit, I won't uh, claim to be a botanist. Uh, birds are my thing. But nonetheless, the, 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 there are specific species of, of mammals and, and, and birds that you go up there. I'll come back onto the golden eagles in a second because they're quite important. But the, the, the main target is simian wolf. Um, this is a simian wolf in front of a tree lobelia here. Um, and we, we actually saw seven of them in ones and, and at one point or two. Um, and they are, as I said right at the start, they are the rarest canid in the world. There are, in, in terms of world population, about 200 animals. That's the entire world population of this, 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 this creature. And they are a stunning creature. Um, the problem, that the, there, are t there are several problems they face. One is encroachment by humans, um, and the other is rabies. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, there, there is a sm very small population in the north northwestern highlands, more towards Eritrea in the Simeon Mountains, and and those are now down to seven animals, I'm told, because they they got rabies into the into the, 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 the sort of pack, if you like. Um, nowhere do they do they actually form a pack, as far as we know, but they, they sort of live in sort of open broken communities, as foxes would here in pairs. Um, but they, 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 they are, are vulnerable, as all, all hunting mammals are, to, to rabies, and unfortunately that's wiped, virtually wiped the one population out. So very, very rare. The, the, the Zoological Society of Frankfurt are, are doing a lot of work to try and conserve these, which is, which is good. Um, they they they're stun, really are stunning animals. And they hunt, they hunt these guys, which are grass rats. Um, there are apparently eight species of rodents that are found up on the top of the Barley Mountains, some of which are endemic. This is one of them. Um, this is called a grass rat. We saw a second one, but we weren't able to put a name to that. And the third one, which was giant mole rat, which is probably about 10 inches long, something 11 inches long, something like that. I said he was quite a smart guy. And so the, 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 the simian wolves, they actually hunt these guys, and that's what their, their, their staple diet is, mole rats and grass rats. Um, but Added to that is all the, 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 the aerial predators, such as golden eagles, orga buzzards, lana falcons, and stuff like that, that all live up here. Now, I said that the golden eagles were important because there's a, this is an adult. This population are the only population of golden eagles south of the Sahara, or breeding population, should we say, south of the Sahara. And it's not quite sure what subspecies these are because they've only recently been found about 15 20 years ago that's an adult this is a well i assume this is a sub adult but unlike our golden eagles it hasn't got lots and lots of white in the wing but it seems to have a white band on the rump it's got a, a, a little bit of gold this bird has got a little bit of gold on another photograph of what you can see it coming in so that's what making me age this as a sub adult but I think there's still a, an awful lot of debate on two fronts. One, what subspecies are they indeed? Or indeed, are they actually golden eagles or are they split from golden eagle? So there's, a, there's, there's, there's still a lot of question marks hanging over these, these birds. But up on the top there, they're, they're quite easy quite to see and quite approachable. We saw three different birds in total. But we have loads of auger buzzards and this bird is common throughout Ethiopia. Um, they are absolutely stunning birds. 
ogres are, are a typical beauty owl, but they're quite short-tailed and broad-winged, as you'll see in the next shot, and they're very, very approachable. So this is a, a light phase auger, and you can see the tail and the wings, the, the wings are so broad that it forms almost like a dihedral, like a Vulcan bomber almost. So that's a, 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 a pale phase, and that's a dark phase. Um, and, and either sex can be either phase, but interestingly, most of the time, in a pair, there's one of each, uh, one pale and one dark, which is strange, and, and I don't know whether there's any, there must be some biological reason to it, but what that is, I don't, I don't know. But augers have got a, a really distinctive uh, flight shape, and they've got this rufous tail in, in all plumages, and they're a, a really stunning bird. So the, the, the Barley Mountains have got a whole host of, of really interesting species. And on the far side of the Barley Mountains, so you're talking on the southern side, southwestern, southwestern side, is what's called the Harina Forest. And then this is probably the biggest area of intact forest in, in Ethiopia. Um, we only got to visit it briefly and the weather closed in on us. And this holds species such as Abyssinian catbird and stuff like this. Um, and, 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 and these, these forests, uh, this or this Harina forest it holds the only mountain lions in 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 Africa, and basically the only lions left in Ethiopia. Um, and there's a whole wealth of in these forests that go round the, the Bali Mountains, um, and th there are scattered forests that go right up onto the northern side as well. But the big Harina forest is in the south. There are things like this. This is Abyssinian ground thrush, another one of the endemics. Uh, and 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 then you've got you've got Endemic mammals up here as well. This is Mountain Nyala, again, restricted to the Bali Mountains. Um, and this is a real stunning looking one. This is Menelix Bushbuck. This is another another um, another endemic mammal of, of Ethiopia. So there's a whole host of really interesting species up in, in these uh, montane forests and grasslands and moorlands that are well worth looking at. But adding to that, big populations of things like olive baboons um, and, and warthogs, and then it just makes for a, a really, really interesting, really, really interesting area to, to visit. Um, and I, I can't wait to go back. So, so by this point, we're, we're here. I'll just put this map in so you can keep a keep abreast of, of where we are. We're now going to head down to towards Nageli and Yabello, which are heading down much lower down. Um, and that's an African wood owl. Sorry, he was out slightly out of sync. He should have been with the with the the, the, the ground thrush. And that this is this is basically a, a relative of our tawny owl, but lives in in in, uh, in, in mountain forests in in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa, so he's not an endemic. But, so we're heading down south now, we're leaving, we're leaving the Barley Mountains and going down into a totally different habitat. The soil becomes much redder, more barren, although it's, there's still sort of scattered woodland, um, quite heavily wooded, you can see here. Lots of termite mounds. There are an awful lot of people in this, this habitat, scattered, trying to make a scraper living really from the, from the habitat. Um, and a lot of this, this, this understory is grazed off by goats and sheep and things like that. But nonetheless, there's some really, really special birds down in this area. And then this whole tour was really designed around, this itinerary was designed about seeing the endemics, picking up as many of the endemics as we could. This isn't an endemic, this is red and yellow barbet. This is the male bird, this is the female bird. Um, and every termite mound, I'll just go back one second, you can see all these termite mounds. All the ones of any size in this area have all got their own pair of, 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 of red and yellow barbets on there, and they tunnel into the into the termite mound and use that as a nest, but also prey on the termites for food and and, and other insects, and that's their their territory. But this whole area has got lots and lots of really interesting birds. The different species of starlings. I think Ethiopia has got something like. Uh, 15 species of starlings, of which we saw, I think it was 11, something like that. This is probably one of the smartest. This is superb starling, which is quite widespread in Africa, but nonetheless, it's a, a really, really good bird to get. And, and, and to be able to walk up and photograph these was stunning. Things like cardinal woodpecker we came across. This is a, a female. Um, they're only about the size of our lesser spotted woodpecker, so they're quite a smart little, little woodpecker. Um, and this was, one was in an acacia, but of interest here, you can see the, the thorns on the acacia. Uh, if you get close to them, they've all got a little tiny hole, you can just about make out the hole on there. And they're actually galls, so you get a, a gall wasp that goes inside, the, that burrows into them and lays an egg, and then the grub causes this, this gall on the, the acacia thorns. 
So that's uh, an interesting shot for, for that as well. But the, the, the real prize then in this area of Anagelli, or one of the two real prizes, is this bird. This is Prince Ruspoli's Turaco. Now, the Prince Ruspoli's Turaco is known from just a handful of sites in this area. And it was first found in 1870 by an Italian explorer called Prince Ruspoli. And he, he, he shot a couple of specimens of this bird. And three weeks later, before he could do anything with them, he was killed by an elephant. And so when his belongings and his, his collection of specimens were sent back to, to Italy, um, this bird was, was then known to science, but because he hadn't made any notes where it was, nobody knew where. And so it vanished into the ether again for a period of, of about 100 years. And then in the, in the 1970s, there was a, it suddenly re-emerged and there was, a, there was a, another sighting of it. And then it was lost again until about the 1980s when it was refound and it was finally nailed down to this area of, uh, 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 of southeastern uh, Ethiopia along the Kenyan border. And it was known, it's known from, from about a dozen sites, something like that. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a real special looking bird. It's got this white plume of a, of a crest that comes down there with a, a touch of salmon pink and blue around it. And these red eyelashes. It's a real smart looking thing. And it's a, it's a close relative to, 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 to trogons really, and to parrots. And I would suspect that it's not that far evolved from things like quetzals, because if you've ever been to South America and looked at quetzals, the head, the head arrangement and the, the bill arrangement is almost identical to this. It could just, of course, be convergent to evolution, but nonetheless, I think there's, there's some sort of uh, close relationship there going on. But in this area, there's a whole host of, of, of really good birds. The, 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 the land becomes much flatter and more rolling down towards the Kenyan border. And out east of Nigeli, there's a, there's a place called the Liban Plain. And if any of you are RSPB members, you'll have probably seen in the RSPB magazine uh, 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 two issues back about the Liban Plain. They're talking about the Liban Lark there, which is restricted to this one plain. This is the Liban Plain you're looking at here. It's a, a big open grass plain, these dotted little farms and huts across it. And, the, and the, 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 the locals have got herds of cattle and sheep, which keep this plain open. But it's, it's vitally important because this, this, this endemic lark, the Liban lark, is found nowhere else in the world. And it's thought that there's about 200 pairs, something like that. So the, 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 the locals, they, they, they make sort of like a thorn hedge, small thorn hedges around the, their property, their little property. And, and that whole, those whole birds themselves. But this, although they're rubbish photographs, these are the best I could do with Lyber and Lark. Um, and, and that was the one, one of the few birds that wouldn't let us get close and it scuttled away. So these are vastly blown up. Um, and, that, and they tend to prefer to run rather than to walk. Um, and, and so we, 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 we went down to the Lyber Plain specifically looking for this bird, but other things as well. Um, and it took some finding, I have to say, this is probably one of the hardest endemics to find, but we got there in the end. Um, and then in the thorn hedges I mentioned there, you've got things like more common species such as this, which is pectoral patch cysticola. They've got some really good names, some of these things. And, and, and slight angles, you, you see it's got this little pectoral mark here, and that's how it gets its name. Um, but that's, that's one of a, a, of a group of cysticola species. Um, they're related to our fan-tailed warblers, Zitin cysticola, if you like, that we get in Europe. But in, in Ethiopia here, you've got one endemic being Ethiopian cysticola, um, and you've got about another dozen species of cysticola, um, all very much along the theme like this, and don't have take some identifying, they really do. So you have to work on things like coloured panels in the wings, in terms of rufous panels in the wings, and song and habitat and that sort of stuff to to work out what they are. The, ha the habitat itself attracts visiting raptors from the, from the north. There's a particularly ones that like insects. So things like hobby and that. We, we have one group of 20 hobbies here on this, on this plane. Um, they were pretty spectacular. And at dusk, we suddenly realized we've got Montague's Harriers all over the place. And there's a, there's a, a Montague's Harrier roost there. We actually have 21 Montague's Harriers in the air at once. Um, so how many there properly were there? I think there's nine on that shot. There was one pallid harrier in with them, but 21 Montes. So that was that was pretty spectacular. I've never seen numbers of Montes anywhere else like that. So again, just another quick look. So we're going from Nigeli and the Liban Plain over here. 
over towards Yabello here, the Yabello Wildlife Sanctuary, which is here. And you can see there's the Rift Valley. It sort of opens up more down towards the Kenyan border to the south. So this is the, the road across from uh, Nigella to Yabello. And it's it's a, a pretty rough road, and it does not take some time. And this is the, the sort of uh, what the locals are sort of hacking a, a living out of. Um, I say hacking a living because obviously they're big forest in the place slowly, which is a, a, a bit of a, a crying shame, but at least it's sort of low intensity agriculture. And you can see here, this is looking south down towards the Kenyan border. And even though it's quite remote and wild, you've still got, you can see here, a, a fire that's been set clear in a little bit of land. So that's quite a, a worrying trend, I have to say. But everywhere you stop, there are endemic birds and, and, and really good birds to see. This is, a, a, I think, a white wing cliff chat again, another endemic. This is the female, and this is the male. And we just found these at the side of the road at, at, at a stop. And, and amazingly, we uh, we had a couple of stops on the way, but one particular spot, it was actually this this very spot. Um, we just stopped because the habitat looked nice, and we found our own pair of Prince Raspoli's turricos. So, so they're obviously in this area in, in small numbers, um, but they're there, and, and it is possible to... To come across them and we as i say we just stopped at, a, at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere and we found a pair so it was it just shows you that there's probably more out there in this area it's just lack of coverage that that keeps them so remote and that's one of the things about ethiopia there's so few birders go there there this is a, another one of the really special birds that, that people want to see this is abyssinian ground hornbill um we came across a, a couple of pairs of these this is a, a, a female um, and this is the male with a red throat, throat uh, uh, patch. And, and they, uh, they, they're typical hornbills, they've got casks on the top of the, the bill, but these ones walk around on the ground uh, and feed on the ground, feed on things up to the size of small lizards and frogs and even small mammals and stuff like that, insects, invertebrates, grasshoppers. So they'll take a, a whole range of range of food. We came across red-headed weavers, which, are, which were nest building. This is a, a really smart male red-headed weaver. They're one of my favourites. I think they're a real smashing looking bird. And he feeds more like a tit, sort of hanging upside down, picking about at, at insects. He was he was actually nest building, this guy was. That was the that was the nest, but he kept breaking off and going to have enough feed. And he's building the, the sort of main sort of sling there that's gonna hold the the, the, the the nest together and then he'll fill it out as a as a ball. But you can see it's interesting the way he's weaved the, the grasses round each other. You can see here where they're tied together to hold the whole structure together. So it was really interesting to watch. As we neared, it took us all day to travel across this area. Although in, in terms of as the crow flies, you're talking about 80 miles, it was it, it took us all day to get there. And this is the, the sort of view as we're approaching the, the Rift Valley again from, from uh, Nigello at dusk. So we went through New Bello, where we stayed overnight uh, for a few nights, and then we we went out into the Yabello Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, and this is a really interesting place. There's bits of it are acacia scrub grassland, and there's bits of it that are really sort of a really unique scrub desert habitat, which I'll come on to in a few moments. But it holds two really important endemics um, found nowhere else in Ethiopia, found nowhere else in the world. It's just this one small area. It's surrounded by, the theory is, it's surrounded by a small ring of low hills, and it forms a microclimate. So these two species, this one is the, the this is my favourite, this is Stressman's bush crow. Um, it's, a, it's a type of crow, I think it's closely, more closely to, related to nutcrackers, but they are, they're absolutely stunning birds, and they're really tame again. Um, and and the, the theory is that this, this small ring of hills forms a microclimate and, and has got a, a temperature isotherm, and that's what stops these birds going anywhere else. And the other endemic being the white-tailed swallow, again, Found it, it's got exactly the same range as the as the bush crow, um, as far as is known, um, and 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 again restricted to this one this one small area of southern Ethiopia. But two really highly sought after birds, and literally unless you go to this area, you just are not going to see those birds. This is uh, looking looking across the Yebelo Wildlife Sanctuary towards the, the edge of the Rift Valley, um, and and this is the the sort of the other. The other important habitat, quite unique. This is like a scrub desert. Um, it's got a lot of aloes and thorn bush and stuff like that, small acacias, termite mounds, and, and a really interesting dry area. Now here, the rains have long finished. 
And so you could see the whole area was getting burnt over. These are aloes, you know, types of aloes that you can see here. And it held a whole host of really interesting species, things like bearded woodpeckers, uh, reaper snake bush rikes, purple grenadiers, that sort of smiley bunting, which is this guy. Um, it's pretty, a pretty smart looking bunting, I have to say. That's, uh, not like a not like a lot of our buntings that are just brown and streaky. I think this one is sort of really really plumage quite stunningly. Um, Short-tailed lark is another one of the, the 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 really interesting birds down here. Spreads down into Kenya. And I get the, the impression that this really sort of unique sort of scrub heads down into northern Kenya as well because some of these these species straddle the border. Vulturine guinea fowl is another one of the real special birds from there. Um, and, and if you just look at the head, they look they look horrible, but this, this blue and all this streaking and spotting, they're absolutely stunning looking birds. And they live in big troops, 20, 30, 40 strong, um, picking on seeds and insects. white brown scrub robin is another one of the special birds from this area. Uh, Grey wren warm, there's all sorts of things. This is purple grenadier, this is a male purple grenadier, he's a type of wax bill. And so the whole the whole habitat is is, is alive with birds, and and with it too are some of the, the predators. This is uh, one of the special ones from this area. This is eastern chanting goshawk. We've got the yellow bill, slightly bigger than dark chanting goshawk, which we saw out elsewhere. But down in the southeast, you get these eastern chanters. There's interesting mammals as well down here. This is a thing called geranuk. Um, it's a type of antelope, but it's got a long neck like a giraffe, and it'll stand up on its back legs to reach. Acacia leaves, way, way up high. Um, quite interesting, they are getting up. It was the first time I'd ever come across this animal. And things like Grant's gazelle, there's a, numbers of Grant's gazelle in this habitat. And you can get, get there, that's a, a male Grant's, but you can also see the habitat behind. So large areas of sort of savanna grassland that's ideal for supporting things like these these, these gazelles and getting and stuff like that. So a really, really interesting habitat. From there we come north and we start taking some of the Rift Valley lakes on our way up towards the, the northeast. This is this is uh, Lake Awasa. Now Awasa is a, is a, a very rich lake, it's a, a very green lake in terms of woodlands and reed beds around the outside. And as we came into, into Awasa, I, I, I was stunned really, I sort of got lost a little bit because I said to the guy, where are we we ask you? He said there is the Awasa. I said, it can't be. I said, it was a little village the last time I came here. He says, no, it's a town. I said, how many people live here? He said, 80,000 people. I said, and when, I, when I was there in 1984, there were about 200 people there. It was just amazing. But there's still quite a lot of birds. It's still quite rich. And um, even though it's a big town, lots and lots of our marsh terns winter in there. Whiskers and white-winged blacks. Uh, coming right in close, feeding on insects in the and, and invertebrates, sort of things like dragonfly nymphs again in the, in the, in the water and midges and stuff like that. So here you've got a, a, a juvenile white winged black turn, and here you've got a whiskered turn, a molten adult whiskered turn. And then we've got some smashing views of these guys hunting in the shallows. And these Rift Valley lakes hold a, a, a huge array of wintering um, visitors from the north. And this is one of the real special ones, but it took a bit of identifying. We knew we'd got a, an Acrocephalus warbler here. I mean, these huge, grabbing dark legs and massive feet. It was bigger than a reed warbler. Big, strong bill. It kept lunging off. It was in heavy mold. Kept lunging off and grabbing, grabbing insects. I thought, what on earth have we got here? So we took a lot of photographs of it, and it took a bit of time to work it out. But it was it's actually Basra reed warbler. And it turns out that this is one of the main wintering areas, or perhaps the main wintering area, for Basra reed warbler, uh, which, of course, it, it breeds, in, as the name suggests, in the marshes. Of southern Iraq. So that was a, a really special bird to, to catch up with. But there's all sorts of things like the, the, the local African ones. I said to you, I'd show you a, a, an adult Malachite kingfisher. And, and well, what a stunning bird that is. That's a that's a, an adult male there with a, a, a stunning red bill and streaking on the head. And there's just this iridescent blue. And he, by this stage, the adults have lost all this turquoise spotting on the on the, the wings, but they keep the, 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 the boring on the brown feathers. Woodland kingfisher. I'm going to skip through these fairly quickly. Okay, woodland kingfisher breeding breeding at fish eagles all over the place. Um, this is another one of the endemics. This is banded barbet in the woodlands around there. Garaza colobus monkeys in the hotel grounds. Heading north through to Langano on the lakes there. This is the habitat. Pick up special things like red-throated wryneck in the woodlands there. And a lot of these areas, there are still some quite big protected areas in Ethiopia, although they're not quite as protected as they would be 
here in the West. Things like things like uh, slender-tailed nightjar. I put this one in to show you a, a, a really interesting biological feature of nightjar, which is the shape of the bill. If you have a look at the lower mandible, it actually slides inside the upper mandible and it becomes like a tube lower down here. And, and they actually drink by skimming across water like a swift would. And this acts like a drinking straw. It shoots the water up into the mouth. If, the, if those, those sides weren't sort of rolled round, the water would spray out everywhere. And it's a, a really quite a clever adaptation to, to, to coping with, a, with a, their environment. Um, but you, these night jars, if I tell you that that was taken with a standard lens, that shows you how close that we were able to get to them. Just sat totally unfazed. The, 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 the eagle owls were a little more worried about us. Um, that was a telephoto lens job, but even so, it just sat in the tree watching us. Another one of the endemics is black-winged lovebird. Those are smart little birds, a male on the left, female on the right. Lovebirds and parrots, they were not bothered at all. Um, and I just thought those were really nice shots of them doing what it says on the tin, almost almost loving each other there. I thought that was quite quite nice. Um, again, orange-bellied parrots. All, all the, 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 the areas of sort of farmland, they've all got these sort of hedgerows. A lot of them have got these bits of hedgerows left and, and just trees growing there. Yes, wood is cut for fire, but it's left to regrow. And so consequently, there's some really good rough areas in with all the, the habitation. Heading out towards the east, towards the Somali border, and heading more into northern central Ethiopia, out towards the, the eastern side, you come to uh, Lake Basaka with the volcano of Fantali behind it. Um, this, this, this is a, an active volcano, although it hasn't erupted for about 100 years. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a particular uh, chat, that lives, somber rock chat, that lives on the, on the, on the, the uh, lava flows from there, but we, we didn't manage to catch up with that one. We went on out after trying for that to the Arwash National Park, and by the time we get out this far, the, the temperatures are really cranking up. You're, you're looking at daytime temperatures of well over 100 degrees, so it's really quite warm here. But this, there's a, there's a gorge that runs through here, the Arwash Gorge and River, and, and the, 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 the grasslands around here, are, here's the, this is the Arwash Gorge itself, are, are really quite special. Lots and lots of, of interesting species again here, but a, a completely different mix. This is the Arwash Falls where the river comes through and you've got this really green band, but by October, the rains are finished here, September, October, the rains are finished. And so other than this narrow band of greenery, everywhere else is dry. Lots of things like Abyssinian rollers, hunting the grasslands. Um, there's really special mammals, Basa oryx, um, quite good numbers of them. Uh, scrub hair, all of these things are, 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 are in, in, in fairly reasonable numbers, although they're, they're sort of being pushed by the increase in the human population um, because of things like overgrazing and stuff like that. So that they are struggling a little bit in, in areas close to habitation. Another one of the real special ones is, is Sultz Dick Dick. This is one of the, the smallest antelopes in Africa. It's not much bigger than a, a domestic cat. Um, so this is the male in the background with the, with the antlers and, and this is the female. Um, and, and being so small, these poor little guys are at the bottom of the food chain for an awful lot of the big raptors. And they're a quite, a, quite a good number. Bustards also feel, feel, feature quite highly out here. There are eight species of bustard in Ethiopia, including Kori bustard. Although this is a female buff crested and this is the male. Um, again, we saw reasonable numbers of bustards in the, in the park here. This is a, a male white-bellied bustard, or white-bellied Koran, is the other name for them. Um, real smart looking things. Olive bee eaters. Um, I got the impression these were on passage. We came across them um, and, and uh, we talked, talked to uh, Miyashi about these and he said normally we don't see these, but we're not here at this time of year. He said, uh, he said these must be going through to somewhere. Um, we saw we saw them on a couple of days, and they were all along the power lines. Wherever there were power lines, there was there was olive bee eaters, um, and they were they were pretty smart birds to see. So that was a, a, a real unexpected bonus. That was things like black-breasted snake eagle. They're one of the top predators in this area. Close relative of the short-tailed eagle, and a split from short-tailed eagle. They're they're one of the cicatus eagles. So their main prey is snakes and lizards. They're reptile hunters. Um, the habitat is very, very dry, um, and, and 
and as the, the, the dry season goes on, it becomes very, very dusty, especially where overgrazing has, has happened. Um, and you sometimes see these huge whirlwinds, dust devils, they call them out there, spirals of dust going right up into the sky. And you can see here, there's a railway line at the bottom there, and that gives you an idea of the size within the acacia tree. So you can see how high that column of dust is. So the habitat is quite damaged in certain areas by overgrazing, but large areas, it's still reasonably intact. And we were, we were, when we, we drove out towards the Allegheny Plain, we uh, were coming along the, the road there, and I suddenly spotted that this, this brown harrier eagle crouched down on the top of a, a bush. So we stopped the bus and got out, and as we got close to this eagle, it hunkered right down. And we realised it was actually incubating on a nest. And, and um, but we were, we'd, we'd approached by that stage, expecting it to fly off, not realising it was incubating. So at that point, we gently backed away, snapped up a few shots and backed away. But the eagle stayed quite still, it wasn't leaving because it was more worried about the heat of the sun on its eggs because it was, it was obviously shading them rather than, rather than keeping them warm. So the, the, that was a, a, a brilliant opportunity, although we sort of blundered across it really, so we soon came away. The Allegheny Plain is much the same sort of habitat, perhaps a little more open. Um, we came across things like secretary birds out there, but at the, at the uh, National Park office where we had to go and get a permit before we went into there, um, there was a, 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 a hose pipe that had burst and the water was le left running and I was just amazed that they would leave water running like this in, a, in, 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 in such an arid landscape where it's obviously very precious. And it was crawling with things like, you've got Namako dove here, cutthroat, laughing doves, all sorts of stuff. You've, you've got to, uh, uh, chestnut back sparrow larks here, silver bills. There was lots and lots of birds coming and going here. Secretary birds we found out here, which was the only place in Ethiopia I've ever seen them. Things like grasshopper buzzard hunting the open plains. And these you'll see, if any of you have been to Gambia, you'll see the same species, but a slightly different subspecies over in West Africa. And they sort of hug this sort of dry Sahelian grass acacia scrubland, um, this band that goes right across Africa. We came across this guy, a double banded corsa. Um, that was quite a, a smart looking bird. And there's about five, I think five or six species of corsa in, in Ethiopia. Sand grouse, again, no, numbers of sand grouse, uh, several different species. This is chestnut bellied sand grouse. They're very spotted birds of the females. These less spotted, so more plainer ones are the males. Um, there you go, there's a nice male uh, chestnut bellied sand grouse there. Um, and, and, and the whole environment is just, is just stunning. Um, and it was said to me before the first time I went to, went to Ethiopia, you've never seen a, a sunset till you've seen an African sunset. And I think that's, that's very true. And of course, after dusk, a lot of other special birds come out, things such as star spotted nightjar. Um, first time I'd ever seen this species, um, but it gets its name from these little tiny spots. But that's perhaps one for another slideshow. So on that, I'm going to say farewell and leave you with an African sunset set over the, the hills of Ethiopia. Thank you very much.